everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Anna and today I will be talking about books to read in spring. Let's get going. I am in a different area as you can tell. So this is how it's going to be just for temporary. But uh, yeah, so let's see what we have. So my first book is The Book of Cold Cases by Simon St. James. In 1977, Cla Claire Lake, Oregon. Oregon was shaken by the lady killer murderers, two men. Seemingly randomly mur mur murdered with the same gun with strange notes left behind. Beth Greer was the perfect suspect, a rich, eccentric, 23-year-old woman seen fleeing one of the crimes, but she was acquitted as she retreated to the isolation of her mansion. On the gun, 2017, on the gun, 2017, Shia Collins is a receptionist, but by night she runs a true crime website, The Book of Cold Cases, a passion fueled by the attempted abduction she had escaped as a child. When she meets Beth by chance, Shia asks her for an interview. To Shia's surprise, Beth says yes. They meet regularly at Beth's mansion, though Shia is never comfortable there. Items move when she's not looking, as she can swear she sees them go outside a window. And I really have a window right here. Oh my god. And right behind me. The allure of learning the truth about the case from the smart, charming Beth is too much to resist. But even as they grow closer, she has sense that something isn't right. Is she making friends with a man manipulative murderer, or are there other dangers lurking in the darkness of the gray house? I also find there's a lot like mystery and horror books coming out in spring. Is that just me? My next book is Silver in the Wood, The Green Hollow Duology by Emily Tish. There's a wild man who lives in the deep quiet of Green Hollow, and he listens to the wood, to the bias, then to the forest, does not dwell on his past life, but he lives a perfectly unremarkable existence with his cottage, his cat, and his dialogue. When Green Hollow Hall acquires a handsome, intensely curious new owner in Henry Silver, everything changes. Old secrets better left buried and dug up, and Tobias is forced to reckon with his troubled past. Both the green magic of the woods and the dark things that rest in his heart. My next book is The Haunting of Alejandra by V. Castro. A woman is haunted by the. This is like the inspiring of the Mexican folk. Mexican folk demon by La Llorona, and she unravels the dark secrets of her family history. Aliandra is no longer knows who she is. To her husband, she is a wife, and to her children, a mother. To her own adoptive mother, she is a daughter, but they cannot see who Aliandra has become. A woman struggling with the darkness that threatens to consume her. Nor can they see what Aliandra sees. In times of despair, a ghostly vision appears to her. The operation of a crying woman in a ragged white gown. When Alejandra then visits a therapist, she begins exploring her family's history, starting with the biological mother she never knew. As she goes deeper into the lives of the woman and her family, she learns the heartbreak and tragedy are not the only things she has in common with her ancestors. Because the crying woman was with them too, she is La Llorona, the vengeful and murderous mother of Mexican legend, and she will not leave until Aliana follows her mother, her grandmother, and all the women who came before her into darkness. But Aliana has inherited more than just pain. She has inherited the strength and the courage of her foremothers, and she will have to summon everything they have given to her to banish Lailona forever. My next book is The Capital by Yasunari Kawabata and J. Martin Holman, who is the translator, and Manya Lantins. Set in the traditional city of Kyoto, Japan, this deeply poetic story revolves on a Shiaku who becomes bewildered and troubled as she discovers the true facets of her past. With the harmony and time honored customs of a Japanese backdrop, the story becomes poignant as Shiaku's longing and confusion develops. My next book is The Enchanted April by Elizabeth Vaughan Arnim. A recipe for happiness for women, one medieval Italian castle, plenty of hysteria, and solitude is needed. The women at the center of the chant and April are all alike, only in their dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction 
with their everyday lives. They find each other in the castle of their dreams, where classified ad in a London newspaper one rainy February afternoon. The ladies expect a pleasant holiday, but they don't anticipate that the month they spend in Portofino will reintroduce them to their true natures and reacquaint them with joy. Now, if the same transformation can be worked on the husbands and lovers, the enchantment will be complete. My next book is The Arabian Nights by Anonymous A.S. Bayard and Richard Francis Burton, who is the translator. So this is a uh, story told by Shahrazad of 1001 Nights to Delay His Execution by the eventual King Shahania have become among the most popular in, in both Eastern and Western literature as recounted by Sir Francis Burton. So we go from Adventures of the Aladdin and the Enchanted Lamp to the Facile Young Woman and Her Five Lovers. And of course we have the social criticism of the Tale of the Hunchback. The stories depict a fabulous world of all powerful enchanting princesses and source, powerful sorcerers and genies in prison in bottles. But despite the imaginative external grants, the tales are anchored to everyday life by the realism, providing a full and intimate record of medieval Islam. Right, so this is a kind of like a non-fiction kind of thing. I only picked it up because I thought it was interesting. And that's the Aphrodite Biography of a Flower by Helen O'Neill. So basically it's just um, explaining what a daffodil is and like the symbolism from like every queen of love, rebirth, eternal life, and misfortune. And we have Daffodil has been so many things to so many people. It was called Narcissus by the Greeks and prized by the Romans as guarantee of passage to the underworld. It was used by medieval Arabs and ancient Chinese for its medicinal, med medicinal properties and has inspired poets, lovers, artists, and scientists down the ages. So I'm really excited about this. So I don't really read enough nonfiction, so I thought I'd pick this one up. My next one is Life in the Garden by Penelope Lively and Kate Scott, who is the illustrator. Penelope Lively has always been a keen gardener. This book is partly a memoir of her own life in gardens, a large garden at home in Cadio, where she spent most of her childhood, her grandmother's garden, in a sloping Somerset field, then two successive Oxfordshire gardens of her own, and a smaller urban garden in the North London home she lives to today. It is also a wise, engaging, and far-ranging exploration of gardens and literature from Paradise Lost to Alice in Wonderland and of writers in the gardens from Regina Wolfe to Philip Larkin. So and again, that's also a non-fiction memoir. So. And my final one is Shadow of the Fair and Tink Print Number no. 1 by Leah Waite. Ignorance is truly a bliss from recently widowed Maggie Summer, owner of Shadows and Tinks when she arrives at the prestigious Renaissance Land, County Spring and Tinks Fair. Sadly, she won't remain ignorant of the suspiciously high mortality rate among her fellow Antiques dealers for long. Rumors are everywhere. The most recent victim, John Smithstone, died of a poison at a show just last week, and many of the same dealers here are here at Renaissance Lair. I'm sorry to say that wrong. They make the identical circuit year after year, so they know each other well. Or do they? Mother is still far from Maggie's mind as she arranges her shadows boots, Tom Currier and La Ives Prince here. Winslow Home, a wood and grave is on the heck wall, and the prince arranged on tables and easily by category. With 11 years' experience, she knows her stock. So far, the worst thing that has happened was putting a long price tag on a Homer engraving and having to sell it for $170 instead of $1,700. So that's a lot of like a big mistake. So I actually have a few more, and that's The Secret Garden by Frances Hodge and Burnett. So when often Mary Lennox comes to live at her uncle's great house on the Yorkshire moors, she finds it full of secrets. The mansion has nearly 100 rooms, and her uncle keeps himself locked up. And at night she hears the sound of crying that one of the long corridors, the gardens surrounding the large property of Mary's only escape. Then Mary discovers a secret garden surrounded by walls unlocked with the missing key. One day, with the help of two unexpected companions, she discovers a way in. Is everything in the garden dead, or can Mary bring it back to life? I love the secret garden, so I kind of want to revisit and read it again, so I love it so much. <laughs> we have Little Women by Louisa Mary Alcott, Virginia, and Balancia Girls and Goldest. I'm so sad that wrong. And Marta Feely. 
So basically, this is Alka based Little Woman of Her Own Life, while her father, the free thinking reformer and abolitionist, runs on Alka, home knobbed with such eminent male authors as Emerson, Thurmer, and Hawthorne in Louisiana, supported herself and her sisters with women's work, including sewing, doing laundry, and acting as a domestic servant. But she soon discovered she could make more money writing Little Women for her lasting fame and fortune and far from being a girl's book. And my next one is Anna Green Gables by Ellen Montgomery. It is an old fashioned farm outside a town called Elvin Lear. And Shelley, an 11 year old orphan, has arrived in this red dead corner of Prince Edward Island, only to discover the Cuthbert. And only Matthew and his stern sister Mariella want to adopt a boy, not a feisty red headed girl. But before they can send her back, and who simply must have more scope for her imagination and a real home, wins them over completely. And my next one is Pride and Pledges by Emma by Jane Austen. I don't know why you said Emma, because Emma is also on my recommendation as well. <laughs> but um, when Elizabeth first meets a legitimate bachelor, Fitzwilliam Darcy, she thinks him elegant and conceited. He is an indifferent to her good looks and lively mind. When she lately Later discovers that Darcy has involved himself in the troubled relationships between his friend Bingley and her beloved sister, Jane. She is determined to dislike him more than ever. I have watched the movie, but I haven't read the book. I do love the movie. I thought Kevin Knightley did a good job of it, so I do love the movie. And that's also Emma. So I also really like watched Emma, but I also never read it. But so that's fun. Emma Woodhouse is one of Austin's most cop captivating and vivid characters, beautiful, spoiled, vain, and irre irrepressibly witty. Emmy organizes the lives of the inhabitants of her sleepy little village and plays matchmaker with devastating effect. And my last one is The Matchmaker's Game by Linda Cohen Lungeman. Is finding true love a calling or a curse? Even as a child in 1910, Sarah Gilfan knows her gift. She is a maker of badges and a seeker of soulmates. But among the pushka crowded streets of New York's Lower East Side, Sarah's vocation is dominated by the rude older men, men who see a talented female matchmaker as a dangerous threat to their traditions and livelihood. After making matches in secret for more than a decade, Sarah must fight to take her rightful place among her peers and to demand the recognition she deserves. But okay, so that's all the books I ha I have to read in spring. So let me know which one you want to. Which one let me know what you're going to read for spring. So please like, comment, and subscribe so that you'll be notified every time we post. And I will see you in my next one. Bye.